Aloha and welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahee. And as usual, every so often I check in with my special stand-in guest, Jay Fidel. He's the guy it. who uh, <laughs> spends a lot of time on our uh, Citizen News Network. And so he has a sense, he has a sense of what's happening right across the community. And so it's my pleasure from time to time to check in with him. And as we were chatting uh, earlier today, we were talking about a uh, some recent articles that uh, were in uh, of our news media. And they were talking about how Hawaii's political system may be broken. Now, it just so happened that he and I have become, uh, you know, have had a number of chats. Jay and I have a number of chats about uh, the, the how the thing seems to be broken on the national level as well. And so, that you know, it, the subject interests me, and, and and it's in some senses very specific because when you talk to people, they'll tell you this, and that, and this, and yet in other senses, it seems to be so amorphous. And, and something that needs to be changed. So, so Jay, okay, welcome. Good to have you back again. Thank you, John. I, I, I wanted to start today actually with the, with the federal government, you know, because I, I spend very little time uh, myself talking to people about that, but I, I read a lot and it, and it seems that, um, I don't know, it just, <laughs> We had a president who was driving at least me crazy, uh, and then he lost the election, and he's still driving me crazy, and we still don't seem to have gotten rid of uh, the kinds of things that are percolating up there. So I mean, what, what's your impression? I mean, where are we? Well, I think we're at the edge of a cliff. And uh, we're, you know, at great risk of falling down that cliff any day. Okay, so uh, it, when, it, it you say edge of, when you say edge of a cliff, um, it, what, what do you mean? Like the country book? Uh, what, I, I have to tell you what I have. I have a sense that we are standing at the edge of the cliff. I just don't know when I look down what's, you know, what's down there or what I'm falling off of. Uh, uh, I, I um, I'm reminded of uh, a conversation I had with um, uh, an African guy from Rwanda, and uh, okay. I, you know, we're talking about genocide, and so I said to him, uh, you know, gee, uh, that, I guess that's what happens when the government fails and people are divided and they go after each other, and he said, no, no, he didn't think the government failed at all. Um, in Rwanda, the government was still in place. It's just that the people who were the officials in the government um, had become interested in their own, you know, the, their own silo, their own self-interest. Um, they were corrupt. And, um, you know, what happened at the end of the day is uh, they had to distract the people out there in order to avoid the, the hot light of, of, you know, public information about that corruption. So what they did is they divided the people into the Hutus and the Tutsis, okay, which was an artificial division, um, and um, and then they uh, encouraged them to kill each other. And in fact, the government actually uh, helped kill people on both sides. And after a while, wow. it, be, it became uh, you know kind of an occupation. What are you going to do today? Oh, well, I'm going to go kill somebody. Um, and the whole country was involved in this killing. And, and this so, is this what they had fostered. This is two racial, uh, two different tribes. Not really. Uh, no, no. They were actually, uh, I don't think it was a long term kind of division. Uh, I asked him, you know, did the, did the Belgians create this? He, no, no, this was, this is some sort of very artificial division. And it had something to do with economics, uh, farmers and ranchers, you know, something really not all that consequential. Um, and, and, and yet they wound up killing each other. Um, so anyway, so the, here's where the conversation went, and I, I am answering your question. Um, so um, the government had failed. I'm sorry, the government had not failed, but the officials had failed, uh, and they wanted to distract people, so they caused the genocide. 
and, and and that was to their interest because then they could you know keep on with the corruption and uh and they could um, you know keep operating their own self-interest and he's he lives here he's kind of an exile he lives in the united states uh, and uh that he said and i didn't say it he said you know this kind of thing is happening in the u.s too there are so many officials in the federal government anyway who are self-interested and who are corrupt and who can't tell the truth they're unable to tell the truth but they have to distract the people and so they create the division and and when that doesn't work so well anymore uh when people are not so distracted you know anymore uh then they will you know they will raise the heat and create greater distraction and foment unrest and violence um, and that's the way this process works. And, you know, you can't really make a distinction between what happened in Rwanda and Africa and what could happen here in the U.S. We are- Oh, on a, that on a, is spooky. Yeah. That, that is spooky. I mean, that's darker than I, I, uh, <laughs> I thought, you know, and, and so in a way, but Rwanda wasn't the only place. I mean, in a sense, that's what uh, Hitler did with the Jews. He needed a distraction, and so he he put one together. In that case, he didn't, he, you know, and they they had scapegoats. They had scapegoats all over the place. In America, we seem to be having more division than ever, and I I don't know whether it's been deliberately done by people inside the government as well as uh, as well as people outside. Uh, in the same sense as Rwanda, but the consequences are the same. Consequences are the, the, the divisions actually seem to be distracting us from solving problems. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like, for example, in Congress, it, it's, there was a time when Congress, when the, the, the both sides tried to find a common middle. And now it seems like the way to power is to uh, get power is to just divide people. And I don't, I, I don't know, Jay, it's, it's nasty. I, I was reading, uh, every day you read some article on, on about racial tensions in, in America and how, for example, uh, there was a, a recent article about uh, uh, students who, flew the Confederate flag and uh, I think it was one of the southern states, Tennessee or something, and other students protested and the protesters got uh, suspended and the people who flew the flags didn't, and all of this stuff. But the difference is at one time in our lives that uh, it would only have been used in Tennessee, <laughs> but now the whole nation knows it and so Everything is more divisive. I, I don't know what. What's your sense of all of that? You know, where is all of this going? I I don't know how we got to where we are. It's very hard from a an historic point of view, an historic analysis, to figure out where we are, uh, and and rather how we got here. Uh, but one very interesting commentator was the uh, the Bernstein and in, in um, you know Carl Bernstein. Um, uh, and um, he, he hasn't written a book like his partner, uh, Woodruff, but, but he, um, he, he certainly has spoken about what's happening. And his latest comments um, you know, revolve around the notion that we are having a civil war and, and we are or arguably in a coup. I think he said that. We're in a coup. We have some people want to you know, take over the government illegally without relying on the constitution or the rule of law. They just want to take it over by any means. And I think you, you can know, see that. You can see that. And, and it seems like, uh, it seems to me like we, uh, we can say that we are in a, in some senses, in a cultural war, in a war where there really is two, two Americas. And, and, uh, and because of that, because it's tied to something else than our own freedom, or our families as a whole, it, it, and, and in the belief system, what I'm sensing is that it, 
some the norms no longer seem to exist. In other words, we are right, so we need to prevail at, 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 in, in, under any circumstances. And I don't know about you, Jay, but it seems like there seems to be an undercurrent, which I never in my life thought I would see happen in America. And that is the idea that uh, maybe we ought to try a little totalitarianism for a while. You know, uh, maybe we ought to have some, uh, we ought to have uh, a situation where winner takes all and the rest of you that don't agree, tough luck, you know. Uh, we see it on the right uh, with uh, our former president going around and still insisting he won an election uh, and, and some of his support. We see it on the left who are saying, you know, um, not as not as maybe not as uh, dramatically as the former president, but it, it, they're going around and basically saying, "Look, I'm tired of these idiots, you know, who believe differently than me on on thing on cultural issues, and we ought to get into a situation where one vote will wipe them out, you know, and and and, and then we have a president who looks awful weak because he's trying to balance the whole thing." I don't know. This is my well, you know, I think that the measure is, do people have confidence in the government? Do people think the government is able to, you know, uh, solve their problems? I'm reminded of the 30s in this country where, you know, we had a depression and there was soup lines and people starving, middle class, formerly middle class people uh, starving. Um, and uh, there, there grew up a right wing um, constituency that 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 was uh, that favored the Nazis, that favored totalitarianism. There was a substantial number of people uh, in the East Coast who who went to Nazi rallies in the 30s on a number of occasions. Madison Square Garden in New York was filled the place, um, wow. and there, there was the swastika, you know, on the stage, and the Nazis had come from Germany to show the way. Um, bottom line is, I think when when people do no longer believe that the government can solve the problems of the state, um, that's when they consider other options like this. That's when they consider throwing out the baby with the bath. There seems to be that 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 drift toward totalitarianism, though not only here uh, but across the planet. You know, you, you got that going on in various other countries as well. It, it, you know, this, that, that the desire for a strong leader, the desire for, you know, straightening things out. And which brings us really, you know, because you and I can do that for a while, but it brings us to what are some of the causes that led up to this? I know you and I were talking today earlier about like how our government <laughs> over the years have been taught, I've been caught telling lies. We actually lied. And the difference is people found out about it, thought not to trusting it, not to trust them, and, and then begin uh, reacting. We got a one minute break at this time, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about how the government got caught telling its own lies over not only one side or the other, but oh, just you know, in uh, in various times, yeah, and uh, maybe start to apply this to the malaise that appears to be happening in Hawaii today. Yeah. We'll end up uh, in this state. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, we got a short little uh, message for everyone out there. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union. We look at what's happening with human rights around the world, and we invite you to tune in every Tuesday where we feature the voices of the people from the front lines sharing the struggles for self-determination, for the importance of sustainability and solidarity with one another to make the world a better place for all of humanity. If you can't catch it live, you can also 
look at thinktechhawaii.com as well as on Vimeo and many other places to catch the amazing shows where we hear from authors, activists, academics, analysts, and artists who are contributing to positive social change around the planet. Aloha Mekapono. Thank you for joining us for Justice. And welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahei and our regular check-in guy, Jay Fidel. So here we are, Jay, we're, we're just talking about what may have led to the brokenness that we see in, in, in the United States today. And one of the causes appears to be the fact that people, that leaders, that our leaders got caught telling lies. And in this modern day and age, when that happens, it goes right across, everybody knows about it. Now, I'm not just talking about Donald Trump, who we uh, actually people documented him telling 40,000 lies. In some respects, he told so many that it no longer became interesting. But uh, but, but starting with with uh, our entrance into the, the wars in the desert, I mean, we went into Iraq. Oh, was starting before that, John, starting in Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam. That was a huge, big lie. Vietnam was a lie, yes. And, it, and we kept clinging to it for some reason. And, uh, and you know, and, and in fact, it might have been the first uh, big lie that the whole country knew about. You know, that this was not something that we, we did things that we, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, really weren't able to justify in terms of uh, what we were there for. And, and so we start with that and it seems to trickle on, you know, and the Iraqi war, I mean, the, the lie that comes to me, the clearest, which is something you mentioned in our earlier conversations was the idea of um, weapons of mass destruction. In fact, yeah, I, I understand, I, I'm not, was before, I don't know, it's on Netflix or something. There's a show. You know, there's a movie called Official Secrets. In uh, 1989, uh, the UK passed the Official Secrets Act. And the movie is, um, it's a documentary, essentially, a um, docudrama, whatever, it, based on a true story of a woman who, uh, she was a small town girl, came to London and worked in a, a government office there. And across her desk was a memorandum from the American administration to Tony Blair, uh, which talked about weapons of mass destruction, um, but which also, you know, uh, scared her because she knew that uh, this was not true and, um, and, uh, and that they were trying to get Blair, who was apparently willing to go along with it, um, to uh, join them, the, the Americans in the war. And so she turned this over illegally uh, to a, a peace, uh, you know, peace activist organization, and it got to make the front page and so forth. Well, they arrested her and charged her with uh, revealing uh, official secrets. And this is the story of her, uh, her decision to do that. She confessed to doing it, um, but she argued that the war itself was illegal. And therefore, she was, um, you know, duty bound, conscience bound um, to reveal it. Uh, at the end, the crown um, did not prosecute her because it was politically disadvantageous for them to do that. Bottom line is the U.S. was engaged in a great big lie and trying to get other people like Blair to join them in the lie. But do you know the consequences of all of this? I mean, from Vietnam. I mean, you see, the, the World War II was like... The you know, the clean war. I mean, though it was like, in my mind anyway, a justified, although regrettable situation. I mean, it was justified, you know. And then you come to like Vietnam and it gets to be questionable. And then you get to Iraqi and there's a lie. And then all of a sudden we're spending years in places like uh, Iran, I mean, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and then when we pull out, we just we, we just walk away, and thousands of people have died, <laughs> thousands. Of, and it was what for, you got to ask yourself for what you know. And it's I I think this under uh, under uh, just underscores uh, some of the, the, the 
trauma that leads us to today. Um, but you know, bringing all of this home. Okay, here we are. So wait, one more point though, John. You know, deep in the American culture and American history is this notion of exceptionalism. The United States, because of its constitution, its democracy, its, uh, its, its melting pot, you know, social experience, its business acumen, all those things, is exceptional. And that we, we have seen ourselves as, as the best country on earth. My mother told me that every day when I was growing up. Thank goodness you live in the best country on earth. So I think a lot of people have believed this over their lives that, about exceptionalism. And when you find out that in fact you're not exceptional, when you find out that the country is incompetent in some areas, it, 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 its system actually doesn't solve problems, um, that it is making mistakes in various ways, that it is losing ground in the, in the geopolitical competition, you say, hey, they were lying to us. It's the same sort of thing. They told us we were exceptional. We're not exceptional. And then you become discouraged. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely, absolutely believe that. Because, and, and well, I think two things happen. I think a lot of people in general, most people in general just get discouraged. But then again, I think you also have people who refuse to believe that that was a lie. I mean, for their own mind's sake, they got to still cling on to the idea that we are still exceptional. We are, and then you have others who want to exploit that, that, the, that, 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 that fact that maybe things are not the same. And, and the same thing, you know, I, I want to bring some of this home with the time that we got left. And, and it seemed when, when I was growing up in Hawaii, this is paradise. This is, uh, you know, the place where everything was perfect. Uh, your legislature, I, I, I came up, um, grew up during the time when after the Democratic Revolution of 1954, the bad guys had been taken out, the plantations were gone, the uh, Democrats were going to get in there, we're going to have social reform, we're going to have a great society. And, and all the le all the rest of it, and it's been over fifty years, and the same malaise is taking place in Hawaii, in its own way, that may be taking gripping the rest of the uh, uh, of the United States, and you know you gotta wonder how does this all happen? Where, where does where do people get into the situation where they just don't feel like anybody knows where we're going. Well, I think, you know, Hawaii has it's a special situation, a special case, because it's an island state and at 2,500 miles from the mainland. And we have this um, sort of, um, what do you want to call it, complicated relationship with the mainland. I mean, some things we see as cargo cult in the sense that <laughs> if it's from... <laughs> It's a great, it's a great description, by the way. If it's from the mainland, it must be good. Eh? Yeah, uh, which, yeah, which is often wrong, often wrong. But but we do have that. The other, the other is the the flip side is uh, you know paranoia. If it's from the mainland, it must be bad. Uh, yeah, you know, we hate those fit. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, right. Not fit for the local for local consumption. So, like, and and so we you know sometimes we are right about these things. This this this. Uh, you know, this, this dual, dual, you know, decision process. And sometimes we are wrong about it. Um, but I think ultimately uh, we are infected by what happens on the mainland. So they got the anti-vaxxers on the mainland. Before you know it, there's somebody in front of the state capitol with a protest about anti-vaxxers. My goodness, that's not locally grown at all. No, uh, that, fact, that comes directly local, from the mainland, yeah. The local... <laughs> If we do our own history, the local response is the exact opposite. The, 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 because of Hawaii's experience in the 1800s with infectious diseases, Hawaii has always been uh, actually in the forefront of getting things vaccinated. But yeah, we, we seem to get infected with, with, with all these various movements, you know, and um, which is good in some respects. You, you know, it, 
in, in some respects, for example, getting infected by Martin Luther King created the foundation for the Hawaiian uh, movement. Yeah, that's true. You know, and, 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 and the like. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is this perception that we, we have to put up with anything economic that comes out of the mainland. In the, you know, we start building houses, that more, 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 more. And, um, and you gotta wonder what happens to the people that don't get the more, you know, don't get the more. I, I think I, I look at Kakaako and, 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 and in some respects it's beautiful and it's a great place to go. And, it's a, and yet I wonder, you know, why, why we have this, Kakaako, we have all these people living on the streets. And I think people, I think that juxtaposition sort of affects how people think about how a government's doing as well. Cool. Well, I think you know, we're on a kind of um, cliff here too, don't you think? I mean, we have those blue tents. We have people who have dropped out. Um, we, have, we have people who don't have any money, no prospects. Um, and at the same time, we have multimillionaires. Uh, you know, one of those uh, condos in one of the Howard Hughes buildings went for almost a hundred million dollars, John. Uh, and, wow. and they're they're way up high, looking down on the on the blue tents. There's such a tremendous disparity. When you were younger, when I came here in the '60s, um, there was the disparity. They didn't have a disparity like that. No, no. Everybody it, got it along was... better. We, it was all. You know, we're, we're in this thing together, not now. And, and at the same time, we, we are trying to do so much to protect the islands. And, and so we're setting up these regulations and so forth, which i not against. But it seems that every time we do something like that, we start spreading people farther and farther apart. Uh, by that, I mean, for example, there, there are hundreds of stories similar to this one in Hawaii, but I... The story I have from my own family was that uh, when a family, a Japanese family, was kicked off the plantation for organizing and, and they had no place else to live, they walked over to my grandfather and he says, Bill on my yard, you know. But there was no regulations telling them they couldn't build a house on his yard. You see what I'm saying? And when I was growing up, people put up shacks on the beach because that's where they wanted to live and everything else all along the big island and along Kauai High. But you see, you can't do all of that anymore. And, and some of that maybe, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know the answers to all of this, Jay. And um, in one of the questions we got as we are ending this, uh, <laughs> as we, <laughs> which is a logical question, as we are ending this episode, is what are we all going to do about it? Uh, so I'll ask you that, and then I'll go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, my my law firm had a uh, an advisor, a friend of all of us years ago, and um, he was taken off on a trip. Uh, so we were at the you know the the board of directors uh, table there, and we we wanted to sort of get his best advice while he was on the trip, and I said to him. <clears throat> what's your advice? What shall we think about while you're gone? And he said, be decent and kind to each other. Yeah. That you start there and everything else will follow. And I don't see as much decency and kindness as I would like to see in state or county government. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's really good advice. And, and I just wanted to, and then the other side of decency and kindness, though, because this is what my dad, my dad told me when I was growing up. You know, he said, "Son, I'll give you some advice." He said, "Son, it, we we in Hawaii, we try to do things the Hawaiian way, you know, aloha and work things out, be nice and so forth." But then he says, "You know, there comes a certain point when you just gotta go do what's right and kick some butt." So if we don't like what's going on in Hawaii, guys, get up, participate. Don't stand down. Stand up and talk up. 
and you know do it in a way that it brings people maybe be able to bring people together but ultimately we all got to stand for what we believe yeah i think that points out a very important point uh, and i like to express it and see if you agree with me and that is this you know there's a social compact uh, nationally the social compact where everybody agrees this is our country and we will work together to make it thrive and and make it work best um and we're all committed to that it's it's our it's ours it's a proprietary thing and we will mm, it's a social compact it's an agreement and the same thing at the state level there's a fundamental agreement we're going to work together we're going to be decent and kind but we're also going to be you know in this agreement to do it better and and i think that somewhere over the the last couple generations we we've, we've lost that partly because we don't trust government we find that they lie to us uh, partly because um, you know it's just it's too hard and we'd rather go back to our own silo um but it's better however advanced you know the society is however you know, technological it is. However, it's different than the way, you know, it used to be. This change is inevitable. You've got to belly up to the society, to the agreement, to the social compact. And if you do that, if everybody gets on board with that, we'll all do better. Well, our time is up and I'm getting all the signals. I want to thank my special friend and occasional guest, Jay Fidel. And thank all of you for uh, tuning in to this program. We could be going on for another hour or so, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Aloha, everybody, and mahalo for listening.